I'm not a believer uh, that men and women are inherently different in terms of their leadership styles. I don't think it's predetermined. It's not that our brains are different. Uh, but we are socialised differently and male and female leadership is received differently. And so the evidence that we looked at when we were writing the book shows that a female leader to succeed has to manage a balance between strength and empathy. If she's too strong, people will go, oh, she's not very likeable, we don't like her very much. If she's too nurturing and caring, people will say she hasn't got the backbone to lead. So women leaders are already very highly skilled in this balance of strength and empathy. And I think at a time like this, people want both. They want to know that someone's getting the job done, but they also want someone to care about how they're feeling and I think people like Jacinda Ardern and Erna Solberg in Norway have really been able to put that together, Chancellor Merkel, as you refer to. What you can't do in this time is that blustering, strong man, I know, I can tell you, facts don't really matter style of leadership, that's catastrophic because this is a time when, unless you're following the science, you can't possibly be doing the right thing. So I'm sort of optimistic. Um, I know at a time like this to say you're optimistic about something is a little bit sort of controversial, but I'm sort of optimistic that out of this time, we're getting a really strong reminder that government matters and who you choose to lead your nation really matters. And even if you're frustrated and you want to send people a little bit of a lesson, uh, you should be still voting for people who have got the competency to do the job and evidence matters. And I think that in politics in the last few years, people in many parts of the world have lost a sense of both of those things. And if we take those with us into the stage beyond the pandemic, then that'll be better for global politics. Is there a layer of nuance, though, to this question of what leadership has worked during this crisis? Because you have countries like Singapore that have done quite well. It's a very different version of democracy, if you want to call it that. China's obviously been incredibly effective at being able to neutralise the threat, at least they were for some time. Doesn't that slightly challenge this concept that sort of Western democratic female leaders are the, are the winners here and it's, it's other forms that, that are less successful? Yeah, I don't think you can simplify it too much. I mean, the statistician in me would say the sample size isn't big enough. And by the time <laughs> the you're... The sample's up, as big as it gets. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunately, this is the sample size of women leaders we've got. And when you're reeling off nations like Germany, Norway, New Zealand, Finland, you're talking about countries that have got some natural advantages and resources. Mm. And so you've got to control for that as well. Um, there's not one way of managing through a pandemic, but I think that balance of strength and nurturing, strength and empathy does matter to people. So whilst more authoritarian responses can get an outcome, whether the populace, if it was free to accept it, free to project its view, uh, would say that's the style of leadership they wanted, I think is a pretty open question. How do you think our leaders in Australia have done? I'm talking about the Prime Minister, but the Premiers too. Oh, I think across Australia, people have done very, very well. And I've been really pleased to see the spirit of bipartisanship that has been brought to the task. So, um, you know, a Conservative Prime Minister working with Labor Premiers, uh, the opposition leaders at every level helping support the government. You know, we've really had a national effort here. And whilst, you know, Errors will be made, people are human, some things will go wrong. Um, I'd rather be here than almost anywhere else on the planet. I came back from London in mid-March just as things were starting to look more and more grim with the pandemic and I've never been more grateful to feel those wheels touch the tarmac than at that time. Do you think that bipartisanship, that cooperation is holding up under the pressure of this second spike? Broadly, I think it is, yes. I think uh, it would have been tempting for people to take uh, very cheap shots along the way, but I think broadly the bypass... There's been some. I mean, there's... we can't ignore reality here. Yeah, look, 
But compared with business as usual politics, I think you would say a lot of bipartisanship has been held. And I'd also want to pay tribute. You know, the politicians sit on top of a big machine called government, and this big machine's got public servants and people with health expertise and various instrumentalities that for years have been practising what they would do in a pandemic and honing the skill set. And that's come to the fore as well with that, that institution heft, then even, you know, with good leadership, we wouldn't be in the position that we are today. You talk about that. Did you ever actually imagine what it would be like when you were leading that our country, our world would be in a situation like this? Uh, yes, we used to um, practice for it. I mean, as long but as... you do the scenarios, did you actually think that could, that could happen? Oh, yeah. Uh, as long ago as when I was Shadow Minister for Health and Tony Abbott was Minister for Health, um, we did a pandemic uh, preparedness exercise where everybody, you know, the Prime Minister, the Minister for Health, the Premiers, uh, spent a day pretending that they were in the middle of a pandemic with various scenarios emerging and political decisions having to be made about whether you'd put roadblocks up and whether you would contain a population that had been exposed to the pandemic disease. And, you know, I only had a sort of humble role in it because I was the shadow minister, but there was a moment when the Minister for Health had to ring the shadow minister to advise of the circumstances to try and maximise bipartisanship. So it all sounds pretty weird, like we were, you know, um, playing a, a game, um, but it was one way of testing institutional systems systems and responses and working out where the weak spots I'm were. I'm interested to know how close this reality has been to what you and you experienced in those rehearsals, as it were. Oh, I mean, that was, you know, a one-day exercise where you had all sorts of curveballs thrown at you uh, to deliberately test the system. So this has been a much longer period of time and I don't think any uh, one-day war game can prepare you for the relentlessness that leaders are going through and the system's going through meeting this pandemic. But, you know, I, I do think doing things like that, uh, facing off challenges as we have in the past, bird flu and the rest of it, um, we have strengthened the system and that's been all to the good.